Hello, and welcome to COD News. I'm Tom Hamill, and today we will explore into all the opportunities that College of DuPage has to offer its students. First, we will go to Jordan, who will give us more information about the library at COD. I've come to the COD library to find out what it takes to run one of the most invaluable resources to students on this campus. How many departments does the library have? The library is, has six departments, um, but they all have um, a lot of shared responsibilities for duties. And in addition to the departments, there are 10 full-time faculty members that have responsibilities to um, engaging with the departments across campus. So there are um, over 70 people working in the library. So 10 full-time faculty librarians and another 10 part-timers. But within those departments, um, there's anywhere from, you know, three to up to maybe 20 people working in a department. Uh, and like one division has multiple smaller sections like circulation and reference assistance and reserves and distribution of equipment. So, so it's a whole layers. lot of people that yeah. it takes. And that's really the special sauce is having lots of people who have special knowledge of what they're doing so that they can provide really specific help, but understanding broadly what the library is accomplishing so that we can make smooth transitions between all the departments. What does the process of acquiring new books entail? We are always driven by what the students need. That's our first, our first and primary goal. So the liaison librarians, those full-time librarians I spoke with, work very closely with the division faculty and, and working with students to understand what's needed for assignments and programs. And so they select items and they get sent to our technical services and acquisitions department where they are you know, turned into orders and, and, um, you know, and brought through the whole intake process. Uh, but it's a collaborative process where the librarians work together on committees to make sure that we are scanning for all the needs that we have now and looking into the future, um, making sure we're using the right kind of resource, if it be print or electronic, should it be uh, media or should it be a book? You know, so there's lots to consider and we think about it together. Is it uh, the same process for acquiring new movies for the library? It is, we consider um, information is information, right? You know, a book is just as useful as a movie, is just as useful as an audio recording, depending on what you need. So we think about them all the same, but um, new media platforms have definitely give us options for um, thinking about how we bring in movies in a different way. Um, some of our, our newer resources are uh, like a platform where everybody can see everything and only if um, a certain number of people actually view it, then we buy it. So the, the, the media landscape mm -hmm. has provided us with some new opportunities to really respond to what people are really interested in. Is the uh, student need for new books, uh, I'm sorry, let me do that one You're more fine. time. Uh, the new materials that the library acquires, is that solely dictated by the needs of the students or if the library is lacking in content, will they get new material for it that way or is it just uh, on like paper requests? Oh no, we, we, uh, we work closely with the faculty to kind of develop an understanding of what's needed, but we're always scanning for what's out there and what's needed because we have a lot of direct contact with students mm -hmm. and we have a comment box on the website that anybody can drop a comment on so if somebody has a recommendation many times they'll just drop a comment like hey i really wish you had this book mm -hmm. uh, and one of our newer platforms is um, overdrive for ebooks and e-audio books and there's a recommend feature right there in the in the pro in the database where you can kind of put your put your two cents in on what we should buy um, budgets are always a concern, so we're mm -hmm. always looking at it from every angle as we, you know, bring in information. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and for my last question, is there any part of the library that you would like to promote, like a service that students might find interesting or a section of the library that you yourself enjoy? Our newest department is the Media Lab, and that's downstairs where we have, um, we've expanded the space by in by four times just in the last year added more staff expanded all the hours to meet the full hours of the library and it provides access to um, hardware and software for media creation that's available to all students no matter what program you're in so you're in a program where you have access to technology mm -hmm. as part of your class but 
If you're taking speech and you want to work on a project, where do you go for access and help? The Media Lab is the place to go. So we have recording booths where people can do podcasts or do audio projects. We also have a studio space where people can do video projects with still photography and then um, editing workstations with um, all the audio, all the um, Adobe products that you're used to seeing in the classrooms around campus, but a lot more. And the, the really extra great part is that we have staff on hand that can walk people through the process of using it. So it helps bring people up to speed on all the digital technologies and skills that they need to be successful. Well, thank you for your time. That's uh, all I have for you. And uh, thank you so much. You are welcome. Sure. Next, we have Haley giving us a glimpse into the inner workings of the bookstore. I'm standing outside of the COD bookstore, which for some students is a great place to get supplies and last minute items for all your classes. But for other students, like myself, it can be quite a source of stress and inconvenience. So I'm sitting here with Brian Clark, who is a second year. Yeah student at COD about the College of DuPage bookstore as they tend to be a little problematic and what his experience has been with that department. So Brian, <laughs> okay. what has your experience been? Well, I've probably been uh, less than 10 times my, the entire two years I've been here. Mm -hmm. And every single time, it's an absolute nightmare. I've hated it. <laughs> Pretty sure, like, the shortest line I had was maybe 20 people, which is still, like, excessive to me. And the line, too, like, doesn't ever go, like, it switches every time in what direction Yeah, it's like, you know, it's just like, am I going to go down this hallway or, the, like, this corridor? <laughs> and, like, all of a sudden, like, people literally can't walk past if they want something. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the couple of times I was like, let me think ahead and order my books online instead of, like, going around looking for them. And still, because there's so many like people in line trying to get their books that there's no one at like the little short line mm -hmm. to try and get the online books because they're so understaffed. Yeah, and I've, I've like every time I go in there too, it like changes. Sometimes they want you to go to the front counter even if you have an online order. Mm -hmm. And other times, like if you go up there, like I think the first time that I went there, you know, I was like, oh, I have online books to pick up, and they sent me to this to the little place, like the in little the corner. side counter, yeah. And then like sometimes that'll be closed and it'll just have like a little sign and like then you go out to the front and no one ever knows like what yeah. is going on. Have they ever given you like a hard time? Because I know that I've, I, uh, I've had some experiences where they're, very, they're not really good at communicating. Um, like I, for instance, had a book that was on back order. Mm-hmm that they just canceled the order on. It was, a, it was, it was for a, a humanities class that we had to read four novels for, and it was the last novel that I was waiting all semester for. So, you know, when it comes time to go get this book, because I hadn't heard from them, I went down there, because it just said on my order form that it was still in transit. I go down there, and they were like, yeah, we canceled this order because it's been on back order. That's ridiculous. And we couldn't get it for you. And I was like, so and they didn't you... say anything? No. <laughs> oh, my God. And I was like, well, I need the book still. <laughs> so... Yeah, but I need them for class, and, yeah. And everybody else in my class had had a similar issue, and it's just kind of like, okay. <laughs> so, like, what am I supposed to do then, you know? So, like, have you ever had anything happen like that? Well, I know it happened with acting one last semester where mm -hmm. – uh, there was just, we needed an extra script because, you know, we didn't have the right enough people for the two scripts that we had for the class. So she's like, Let, here's a third one. And it is easier for someone to like copy the entire book, like and sit there for like two hours <laughs> than to tell their kids to go to the bookstore and get that third book because it's just, there's no chance because then they have to like send in an email to ask for extra copies and you would probably be waiting for like months. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Exactly, like it's just, and I've heard, you know, I've heard it from professors too. Like, I, and that professor for that class was like, honestly, just buy your books online. He's like, yeah. we're not supposed to say that, but. And you can save money too. <laughs> yeah. It's cheaper. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's hard. It was hard for me this semester and last semester too, when I was, you know, having this issue because I have like a scholarship and financial aid. Mm -hmm. So like that works at the, the bookstore, book yeah. and that's it. So, like, anything else, like, I would have to pay out of pocket, because I remember for, like, Theater Prish, too, we had, um, 
a, book, a textbook that we were supposed to have and they didn't like it was also like an issue with financial aid and it didn't drop in my account until like the first week of school mm-hmm. and I didn't really know how that worked yeah and so I had to wait to order my books until that hit you know mm-hmm. and so then I didn't have it for like you know by the time the first kind of assignment just was around. due yeah yeah so then I had to buy the online version and use that for the first assignment so I went back there and I was like hey is there a way that I can either refund that book that you've ordered or get reimbursed for this one that I had to buy on my own? Like, and they were just like, no, no. That's awful. I was like, okay, that is the least helpful. Yeah, <laughs> literally. So it's a, oh God, it's a whole nightmare. And I also find that if you don't get in the bookstore, like right when it opens, you're gonna wait no matter what Mm -hmm. like unless you're literally like one of the first five people in that store you're gonna have to wait like minimum like 20 minutes like it's it's the worst it's i hate going in there i literally try my best to avoid that at all costs it's true yeah and for good reason yeah (laughs) it's the worst um so is there anything else that you'd like to add or is that kind of sum up that's you know that's like the gist of it you know have you heard any stories from, like, any of your friends that are, like, kind of outrageous that were surprising? I know I talk about it a lot. Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of something that was in the group chat. Like, something I think it was that Emily said or something. I don't remember. Oh, yes, that's right. She said, like, she waited, like, an unreasonable amount of time. And, you know, like, sometimes I heard, like, my friends have been late to class. They're like, sorry, I'm at the bookstore. And the teacher's like, yeah, I get it. And they'll just excuse them. Yeah. Which is like, they're just like, yeah, I'm going to be late. Just to accept that it's either I don't get the textbook or I'm late to class. <laughs> right. And that's, uh, God, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. So I'm glad that I'm not alone in this. Oh, I'm like... sure half the school at least would agree with us. <laughs> I know. I, and that's such a shame. But it is what it is. Well, thank you for yeah, no taking problem. the time and sitting down and talking to me. I appreciate it. Yeah, no Yay! <laughs> I got to learn more about campus accommodations. I'm Tom Hamill, and I'm here today at the Center of Access and Accommodations interviewing Michelle Savato. How does the Center of Access and Accommodations help students? So any student with any type of disability can come here to receive certain services. Um, So at the college level, um, any student who has ever been diagnosed with a disability who thinks that they may need some type of accommodation in their class um, would just need to contact our office, provide us with documentation, and then we sit down, um, have a conversation with them, and determine what accommodations would be appropriate for them. Thank you. One of the big one is what subjects are students allowed to use their accommodations for? Any subject. Um, So what we do is each time the student starts a new set of classes, we will look at those classes and determine if there needs to be any type of change in their accommodations. So for example, um, for a student who is in a class that has a lot of tests in it, testing accommodations may be something that is their primary, um, the primary thing that they use. Whereas a student who is in a class that is more project-based, testing accommodations may not apply in that situation. And so we would take a look at um, what the class is made up of, how uh, the student is graded, and then decide whether or not there are other type of accommodations that may be helpful for that specific class. And what kind of resources can the Center of Access Accommodations provide? Like, would they need more like time? Do Mm -hmm. they need certain things for their classes? Yeah, so I can give you some of the most common ones. So I think the absolute most common one that our students here at COD use is extra time to take tests and an alternate environment to take tests in. So typically students will test downstairs in our campus-wide testing center um, and they'll receive double the amount of time that their classmates get to take that exam. Um, Another very common accommodation would be use of a recording device in classroom. Um, So that's really helpful for students who have a hard time keeping up with taking notes or they feel pressured to write down everything that the teacher says and it causes them to miss important information. Um, Using a recording device can help them to focus less on writing everything down and be able to focus and pay more attention um, in the classroom. 
We have an increase of students who have uh, visual impairments. So we are coordinating a lot more accessible textbooks. So an electronic version of a textbook so that the student can zoom in on their device um, so that they can see things in a larger font or for students who have no vision at all, um, the ability to listen to their book out loud. Um, a lot of the other accommodations are really um, decided more on a case-by-case -case basis based on the student, their disability, um, and what the um, objectives of the class are. So that's where it gets a little bit more um, based on the conversation and individualized to the student. Thank you. Sure. Well, I'm Tom Hamill, and thank you for tuning in to COD News. Coming up, have you ever wanted to travel to another country? We will take a look into the opportunities for COD students to study abroad and dive deeper into the diversity on campus. Next, we have Kelsey catching up with Gib Eggy on all studying abroad and field learning. Today I sat down with Gib Eggy, who is the Experimental Education and Training Instructor of the Field and Experimental Learning Studying Abroad and Global Education Department. Um, what are the field studies and study abroad opportunities that CUD has to offer? Uh, we have quite a few and they do change every year and it is all dependent on what our faculty want to offer. We have anything from short weekend experiences which are only, you know, the students are only invested in about a weekend of learning. A lot of our weekend adventure activity courses are that. We also have language immersion programs where we can send you abroad, where you can live with a family, learn the languages. And we also have short-term field studies, anywhere from about a week to two weeks that literally go all over the world. And then what are the benefits of studying abroad or doing field studies? Um, just to kind of broaden your academic horizon, to try new things, meet new cultures, Definitely, if you want to learn a language, that's a great way to learn a new language, is to be immersed in that culture. Um, and also, there's not a huge uh, financial commitment. Let's say you wanted to, you've never canoed and you want to canoe. Uh, for $25, we can take you away for the weekend and you can become a better paddler. You can meet other people. Um, usually at a community college, you don't live with other like-minded students like you do at a four-year school, but doing an experience of learning, a study abroad experience, you get those experiences with other students. Awesome. Um, let's see. So what are some of the more popular locations or programs that students pick? Uh, our language immersion programs are very popular. You know, Italy, France, obviously the top ones. Um, national parks are very big with our traditional and, tradi and non-traditional age students. So I would say the uh, Europe national parks are usually um, two pretty popular ones where we go. Awesome. And then what is the application process like and what are the requirements in order to travel or be a part of a program? Well, you need a valid passport to travel, and we do require that all of our students that engage in any field study program to be at least 18 years of age. Um, application, you can look at your programs on my access, or you can always come to our office here in BIC 3520, and our team will be happy to support you and tell you about all different registration options. Awesome, thank you. And then I have one last question. What sure. is the coolest place that you personally have been to? Cool. Whether it's with Sudi or just personally. Uh, the coolest place. Um, I've done about 30 programs to Alaska, and that's always my favorite place to go. It's very different, it's very exotic, a lot of wildlife, uh, wonderful scenery, and it's kind of like going outside the United States with still staying inside the United States. So I'm going to go with that right now. Ask me next week and it'll be different. Awesome. Coming up after the break, we will get an insider look into COD's theater program, plus an exclusive interview with a COD professor who has the secrets to making it into the film industry. Next, Anna Sieg will gives us a deeper look into the theater department at COD. There's a legendary theater here at COD and even better performances. Not every student knows about it and everyone should come see the shows. So we talked to Haley De Silva to tell us more about COD theater. What is the upcoming show? Um, so there's two shows that are, you know, one is currently in its run, which is Scenes from an Execution. It opened last weekend. It's going through this weekend and closes next weekend. Um, and the other show that's coming up is Clue, which is the show that I'm in. And that opens um, the weekend of March 26th and goes through the weekend of April 5th. Okay, and what part, like what role do you play in Clue? I'm playing Miss Scarlet, which has been very fun. Um, so that's one of the guests in Clue that 
runs amok and causes havoc. So that is. <laughs> okay. And what got you interested in COD theater in the first place? Um, so I was involved in theater in my high school. I love doing that. I love performing in any, any capacity. Um, but I took an acting class my second semester, my first year here. And um, I didn't really do like any, any shows the year before because I didn't know when auditions were and all that kind of stuff. Brand new place, all that good stuff. Um, but my professor asked me to audition for the acting scholarships and stage management scholarships that they have at the end of the year. And I got the Belushi Acting Scholarship. So part of that is you have to work on some shows either through like assistant stage managing, helping with costumes, and just auditioning for the shows in general is an expectation, which I would have done anyway. <laughs> but um, so I was in Macbeth, which you're not supposed to say, but um, last semester. So that was part of my like first semester requirement. And then I auditioned for Clue this semester. So like that was, you know, partially driving. It was just that general expectation, but also just because it's awesome and I love doing that. But People should really audition for those scholarships, though, if you're in the theater department, because it really helped me out a lot, and it's super fun, you know? It's like a win-win. Yeah. So, yeah, I've had a great experience. It's like a little family. It's so fun. Everyone's so great. All the professors and the shows is just so much fun. So, I was very lucky to find this program. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. We now go to our correspondent, Sam Stevenson, who has a story for all students wanting to study in the film industry. Dr. Freeze was a writer and editor for multiple Star Trek projects. He also wrote for the animated Spider-Man um, show. He also worked on uh, NBC's Quantum Leap, Thundercats. He also has an Emmy nomination and got a Writers Guild of America award for one of his sh shows, Star Trek The Next Generation. Dr. Freeze also has a new book out called Secrets Your Textbook Will Not Tell You about TV, movies, and life that I got a chance to talk to him about personally. So I have been incredibly lucky in my life to learn lessons from these amazing, brilliant people, and the book goes into lessons I've learned that have helped me, that will help people in general. Uh, they're lessons about life. You know, the key things that you have to deal with in life, these people taught me a lot. What was the decision to kind of take this book and publish it online versus doing it online? In the past, uh, I've gone with other books with regular, traditional publishers. Uh, you know, the big guys like, uh, just big, big book publishers. And it's, it's irritating to me because they say, pull out this picture, Sandy, but I love that. Pull out that picture, Sandy, but I love, that's my dog. You want to take my dog out of my book? You know, these days, you don't have to go through the big entities anymore. Be, be that music, be that mo uh, movies, you can go straight from the creative person to the reader or from, straight from the creative person to the music listener. So there's no reason for me to give a book publishing company a big chunk of my pie to aggravate me. Was there a reason for you deciding to keep this nice and short? Things today on film, on, on television, in media, people understand an input short better than lengthy. I myself am short. <laughs> So that was a factor in the equation. I'm only 5'7", it's very tough for me, but I'll, I'll be okay. Uh, everything's short. The paragraphs are deliberately short. The reason the paragraphs in the book are short, when I said something and when I hit what I wanted to hit, that's it. Move on to the next idea, move on to the next chapter. There's nothing extraneous in my book. You know, it's either there to teach a lesson from Stan Lee, or it's there to teach a lesson that I learned from Gene Roddenberry, a life lesson. It's there to amuse, get a laugh. The flow of the thing is just the way I want it. There's serious portions. There are portions that are sad. There are portions that are, people told me, really funny, laugh out loud funny. I accomplished what I needed to accomplish. And also, I didn't want to write more. One thing you can take away from it that a film student should definitely get. Enjoy your life. Because it's over real quick. You know? Uh, that's a big, big thing I've learned. Be as loving as you can. If I can go, you know, we're looking at the scene. I envision the scene, my last uh, minutes alive. And if I can look back in my last minutes alive, I'm in the hospital bed, 
and chewing the remains of my tuna fish sandwich. Some of the celery's getting stuck in my gum sockets, but I don't care because I know I'm gonna die. If I could look back and go, I enjoyed my life overall for the most part. I was as loving as I could possibly be. That's all I need to be okay with the life I lived. And under that kind of parameter, whatever I've written was meant to hopefully educate or entertain or make people laugh. That's an act of love. Uh, when I've done it, most of the time I've loved and enjoyed writing the script. The great majority of my life to this point, I've loved. I've, I've loved other people. I've enjoyed myself. I'm okay. I'm feeling okay with myself. The book, Secrets Your Textbook, will not tell you. Uh, the book is predominantly about how to live your life. Uh, and I get into the mistakes I made, because I've made plenty. There's one chapter called Stupid Mistakes I Made That You Should Not. Uh, you know, it, at my point in life, it was fun to write about, but in a way it's kind of a loving gesture. Hey, I made stupid mistakes, we're all human, please don't do this. <laughs> do you think that students who want to get into the film industry, whether it's as a director, a producer, an editor, whatever role that is, do you think they're taking the right steps by taking classes at COD that are offered in the MPTV program? Yeah, absolutely. We've got a lot of excellent, excellent people in the MPTV program. Uh, you know, people, everybody I know in the MPTV program is really smart in terms of professors and really dedicated to doing a good job. You know, John Rangel, phenomenal teacher, students love him, very dedicated guy. Uh, I've heard from every student who mentions the name David Parrish, how much they love his classes and how cool of a guy he is. And he's, he's held some amazing jobs in the real world. My classes are reporting and writing for multimedia and students say great things about Jennifer Peel. So we have a lot of people who teach MPTV and mass communication classes who are phenomenal people. I'll, I'll give you a couple of other people. Uh, we've got David Felix, who's, he teaches mass communication. He is also an attorney who's been an entertainment business attorney. Uh, worked with a lot of important people. Great communicator, great sense of humor. We've got David Goldberg teaching mass communication. Uh, he has worked for the CIA and he's done some very cool stuff. Uh, also in mass communication we have Joe Goldberg who is a very nice person. He's one of our professors. Joe Goldberg used to work for the CIA and he did some really, really, really cool things for the CIA. And I'm not even gonna tell you what he did because it's up to him to decide if he wants to tell you. But I told him do not tell me anything top secret because I don't want to become killed. Yes. <laughs> that would be bad. Absolutely. I would recommend classes here, absolutely. Uh, you need the basics before you go out into the real world. If you're gonna make mistakes, better to make them in classes than at Paramount Studios. Uh, there are people who think, I don't need the basics, the heck with this. From my perspective, very wrong. You need the basics, you need to know classical story structure for writing, you need to know characterization for writing. Uh, if you don't have the basics down, you will be demolished by somebody who does. I'm Nick Kinzel, and today we dive deeper into the MPTV department as I interview instructor David Parrish. So welcome to the show, David. So I don't really know much about this department, so can you kind of fill me in about the MPTV department? Well, MPTV is motion picture and television, and so there are aspects from animation to film study and history and um, understanding to television news and different television production and programs. So basically, uh, it's a whole department with state-of-the-art equipment where you can learn if you want to be behind the camera, shooting stuff, being a filmmaker, being a television maker, to being a reporter, being a writer, being 
being, uh, you know, on camera, the one fronting this stuff. So there's something for everybody here. So how many classes do you teach here? I teach one class. I'm just here on Friday mornings, and uh, in the spring it's called uh, Writing and Reporting. And basically it's television news oriented. And my ideal is to prepare people for a job in television news and make it, you know, realistic what it's like for them um, to go into work each day. You need to write a breaking news story. Sometimes you need to write a, a profile on somebody or something, or you need to put together a whole report on something that's going on and make it realistic as far as deadlines go about, you know, the difficulties that come up and all that. Okay, so I got, I kind of got to walk around this place a little bit and I noticed this giant studio. So can you tell me a little bit about what goes on in that studio? This is a really nice studio. It's, um, we can do cutaways as we do this, but it's got three cameras connected to a control room which is connected right next to our newsroom. And um, when we're doing productions that go through the control room, um, you know, they can cut from one camera to another, to a three shot or two shot or one shot. Um, you can change the monitor that's behind us for different backgrounds. There's a huge set here where you could probably have four anchors plus, you know, two extra correspondents and everything. And across from us, there's the green screen. We can do all kinds of stuff these days with green screens. And an interview set. They all have separate lighting grids to work. So it's real simple. You know, you push one button and that sets, set is lit up. So pretty much what you're telling me is that students who take classes in the MPTV department actually get a chance to like work the camera and everything. They get to pretty much do everything that you would see on a real TV set. Right, and a lot of colleges you have to wait until you're a junior sometimes to get your hands on actual equipment. This from the get-go, you can get in the door and be anchoring something, you know, your first semester. So it's a lot of great opportunities. Wow. So it seems like the MPTV department is a real place to be if you're interested in doing that. So thank you, David, for joining us today. I'm Nick Kinzel. And now you more, know more about COD than you ever knew before. That's all for today. For COD News, I'm Tom Hamill.